Well, I'd just like to say that uh, David was actually um, probably the most important motivator for me to really get serious with doing quantified. I read the National Geographic. It's horrifying, uh, actually, to find out that we have that much uh, in the way of environmental toxins in us. Particularly, I love the fire retardant. Um, anyway, so um, I'm just going to take you briefly through my quest. I um, sampled uh, 20 years in the Midwest and ended up as the average American is, uh, three quarters obese and overweight. I came to La Jolla, looked around, and realized that if I didn't change my program, they would send me back. Um, <laughs> And so a lot of my early writing on this was in the first five years from 2000 to 2005, in which by uh, making major changes in nutrition, namely learning what the fundamental biochemistry of your body is and therefore what it expects you to put into it if you want it to work well. And that was a real revelation as a scientist. And so that uh, changes of nutrition and exercise and quantifying all that uh, was really my first five years. Uh, MIT Tech Review did a profile on me recently in our lab. This is in my institute, uh, California Institute for Telecommunications Information Technology in San Diego. Uh, we have an exercise physiology lab. But the real issue is, is now, what about the inside? So I'm not going to talk about the outside measurements. That's basically nutrition, exercise, sleep, and stress reduction, the sort of four pillars of health. Quantified all those things over time but then started quantifying uh, the internals. In particular, I track over 100 uh, blood variables, and I've been doing that. I was doing it quarterly. I'm now doing it uh, at least monthly, sometimes a couple of times a month. Um, and uh, out of all of these, the amazing thing is that uh, only one of them was way above the upper limit, and that was uh, in your blood complex reactive protein, which is um, a measure, a generic measure of inflammation in the body, something I didn't expect at all because my nutrition, you know, I have six fish oil pills a day. I've, I've got massive amounts of omega-3, completely eliminated omega-6. How can I have inflammation? Okay, because most inflammation in Americans is driven by food, by the fact that they're 20 to 1, omega-6 to omega-3 instead of 1 to 1, which is what you grew up over the last million years your genes were formed on by hunter-gatherers. So this is my CRP. It's supposed to be inside that little blue thing at the bottom, a little blue ribbon. Uh, it started off five times higher than normal. It peaked at 15 times higher. Um, they gave me antibiotics. Notice that it dropped quite a ways before the antibiotics. The doctors always love to take credit for the antibiotics. Uh, but in this most recent peak, which was New Year's, uh, so just a few months ago, it was 27 times higher. If you're four times higher than the upper limit, uh, you quintuple your future risk of heart attacks. So I'm not at four, I'm at 27. So that was worrisome. But notice that I had a natural spontaneous collapse of the inflammation before they gave me the antibiotics. Um, so then I started doing stool tests, and because actually uh, in your stool there's a whole lot of other inflammation markers. This is lactoferrin, which is uh, shed by white blood cells when they're attacking things. And you can notice that it peaked up at 900. It's supposed to be less than 7. So at that point I was 128 times above the normal level for inflammation. Had various colonoscopies, and um, at least one of them discovered, uh, several of them discovered a couple of what are called pseudopolyps, inflammations on the inside of the colon. But what you learn pretty quickly, this, this, so this indicates the, particularly the biomarker there at 900, that's the level typical of Crohn's for inflammatory bowel disease. So I had figured out, in spite of my doctors not thinking I had this, that I did uh, by doing the self-tracking. Uh, so, but then uh, it, I wanted to come back to what George mentioned about the importance of imaging. Uh, so uh, I got an MRI interrography where you drink barium and they inject barium and then you sit in the MRI. I also had a CAT scan. There's my liver, uh, transverse colon, small intestines. And then this part of the sigmoid colon, which is after the large intestine comes down, it goes over, it goes straight back and then out the back. Um, well, I was able to just go over and say, just cut a CD and give me the data. Uh, because I've got much better software than you do. 
Um, and so I turned it into 3D interactive fly-through so uh, software. And there you can see my sigmoid, and you can actually see these amazing kinks that are in your colons you would never know about. You can isolate, that's the sigmoid. Notice you think your colon is this real smooth thing. Uh, not so much. And in fact, if you take it and then cross-section it uh, by just moving the cursor, you know, so you can see the size, you see how, uh, how inflamed the walls are? Those are supposed to be three millimeters thick, the walls. They're about 15. <laughs> and, and that's what is characteristics of Crohn is it's an autoimmune disease, so your, your immune system is attacking your, your own colon, and then you can actually see the damage. Uh, so if I had an autoimmune disease, I figured, well, okay, you're, to have an autoimmune disease, you have two things. One, you should be genetically predisposed for it. So I went to my 23andMe, typed in Crohn's, and sure enough, there's the interleukin-23 receptor, which is uh, the pro-inflammatory, one of the pro-inflammatory interleukins. So I'm much more likely to make inflammation genetically. Um, and in fact, then I would, I, uh, going into the literature, you find out that actually that's one of the major regulators in Crohn's. Now, if you look in the literature, what you find is the four main areas that Eric was talking about of the microbes in your gut, and I totally agree with him that the gut microbiome is what we ought to mainly study, and then if you can keep that healthy, then you can have time to go look at the human cells as well. But I think you need a complete reversal uh, to look at this. So here's an example of the number of different, um, let's call them species, that are in these different uh, areas. And you can see that the firmicutes, which have uh, the largest uh, number of species in your gut, fully two-thirds vanish in Crohn's. So your body does away with them. And, and the problem is that, that, is that is that those bacteria's job is to inhibit pro-inflammation. So the first thing the body does in autoimmune is take those guys out then you can have open loop inflammation. Your body's betraying you. And if you look at the actual metagenomics, in other words, sequence all of the several hundred bacteria species for all of their genes, there are 100 times as many genes in the bacteria as in the human, um, you find out 25% are missing. So this is wholesale slaughter. I mean, this is not a small difference. And so uh, I got very excited about getting it my own uh, stool sample sequenced. I sent a sample to uh, the Vinter Institute and to Karen Nelson and uh, Manny Torbel, uh, and I got back just recently a two terabyte hard disk with a, a file with 35 gigabytes, 230 million short reads, uh, and we're now starting to assemble them. It turns out it's gonna take about 100,000 CPU hours of computer time to, to assemble it, uh, but we're well along on it, and what we're gonna look at is how does my microbiome match up with some of the published things? Are I, am I missing two-thirds of my firmicutes or not? And this is, I guess, the thing that I find most uh, interesting about this is that until you quantify yourself, you don't think about it. You don't think about the science. You don't read the literature. You, it's, it's incredibly motivating to educate yourself about how your body works, which at the end of the day, ought to be the first thing we worry about and then learn other things. But in fact, it's just terra incognita. Thanks. <laughs>